Hey, welcome back everybody. Um, I decided I wanted to do a review. I haven't done a review in a while. And I think I have promised you guys that we would take a look at uh, Day is Vault by Fireforge Games. Now, actually, I think this will be the only review on YouTube for this game, which I think is odd because it's been out for a while. Uh, War Games Illustrated Magazine has a review for the supplement called Burn and Loot. But they don't actually have a review for the game, at least not that I saw on YouTube. So, uh, first of all, Day is Vault is a, a miniature war game of uh, warfare or combat during the medieval era. So it's basically going to be pitting crusaders against uh, Muslims or Arabs. And sometimes against other crusaders. I've actually went through the rule book and I'm going to give you guys a quick flip through just to show you some of the quality in the book. I mean, it's it's just packed full of pictures of uh, miniatures. There's pictures of terrain. Uh, there's diagrams and illustrations. And to be honest with you, it's a very thorough and compact uh book i mean this was obviously intended for actual war gamers i mean they didn't lighten it up and the author i think this was done by uh was it alessio cavator so i think alessio is, is a lot of people know a lot of the stuff he worked on i think he worked on a uh, boat action which is actually probably one of the more popular games now as i said this is actually lined at the uh the actual war gamer so if you are kind of a tabletop war gamer or you kind of play you know warhammer romantic games kings of war this isn't going to be for you because this book is designed to deal with uh kind of as close as possible to simulating or recreating all the little nuances that went into a medieval battle uh like I said, I'm just trying to give you a kind of a quick through of what the book looks like to give you some of the production quality, which I believe the production quality in this book is outstanding. I've had this for a while, but I had never really opened it. And so when I finally opened it, I mean, I was actually kind of blown away by how thorough it was and how how good the production quality was. And so that kind of uh, that kind of encouraged me to try to get through it and uh, look at it. now this review necessarily is only going to be of the basics there's there's a lot of depth into this game there's a lot of uh nuances there's a lot of complexity so you know obviously if you want to learn the game you need to buy the book and uh but what i think i can do is give you an overview of some of the mechanics they use and you know and give you an idea if it's something that would interest you interest you more so these are some of the scenarios I think we're looking at now. There's a there's an extensive history part in the book. There's little qu historic quotes throughout the book and so forth. So uh, let's get through the first section. Okay, the first section of the book that's going to be relevant is just some of the general conventions. It says that the game uses six-sided dice. However, it does use other dice. Uh, I think it says there's D D4 d8 d10 and d12 in addition to the six-sided dice and you'll see where they come in talks about the battlefield which i think typically they say it should be six by four uh it gives you the main the main unit or the main uh force in this game is your battle leader so every every unit will have a battle leader or their general and then your overall army will also have a battle leader or general but everything in this game kind of works off of the battle leader uh, then it talks about unit morale which obviously in most sophisticated war games your morale is actually more important than your actual fighting ability or death okay the next relevant section is what's called anatomy of an army and uh, this section deals with putting together your force so every army will be organized as you see here. For example, you will have what's called a vanguard, which will have a battle leader in his unit, a main force, which will have a battle leader, and the units that make up your main force, 
and a rear guard, which will have a battle leader and a unit that makes up this. You can also have an outflanking force, which I think one division of your rear guard can be assigned to your outflanking force. Now, the way this is going to work in the game is each of these divisions are going to have a card. And when the card is pulled, that division can activate. So your rear guard will come on separately than your main force. I think the vanguard gets deployed first as part of the setup. Your main guard will come on with your cards. And then your rear guard can come on later uh, with its cards, as well as your outflanking force. And pretty much, I think the difference between the rear guard and outflanking force is where they're allowed to come on during the battle. Okay, the next relevant section of the rule book, and probably the most relevant section, deals with your battle leaders. Uh, it talks about their stat lines. And this line here in particular, dual, where you see D4, D8, and D10, that's going to be significant uh, with regards to what they call duels, obviously. But then you, it gives you your other stats. Now, the interesting thing is normally you have to roll to create your battle leader. So for his discipline stat, for example, you'd roll on this table and it would tell you what his discipline rating is. I think the maximum is, is three or four. Uh, the same thing with command. So all of these you would roll. And then there's a virtues and flaws. So for here, you could create a battle leader with virtues maybe more than one virtue or with virtues and flaws or with just a flaw and then the, what you determine that virtue and flaw is is on the next table here so if you had two virtues you roll twice on here if you had two flaws you would roll twice on there uh so not every leader would have a flaw right <laughs> and that's actually you know that, that could actually be good or bad because each of these things will have an effect in the battle. It's kind of like a special ability or and the strategies as opposed to the virtues or flaws. The strategies in general seem to affect the whole army. So like there's one where you can seize the initiative if you have this strategy on the table. Whereas the, the virtues or flaws kind of affect the specific battle leader, him or herself. So a stalwart battle leader rolls three dice when making an injury test instead of two. And then I think usually what that means is you take the lowest one. So that's, that's a benefit. The next section is going to be dealing with our units. Uh, and basically, the thing to understand about this section is the game is done in stands, which is kind of odd to, that they use for infantry. They use a 60 by... 50 millimeter stand so that it should be three across two behind that's one stand for cavalry the stand measures 50 by 50 millimeters so and that would be two cavalries in the front and two cavalries in the back now i tried to visualize this and this is what i came up with so this would be a, a legal stand of infantry and these are some manic guys who aren't on here too well but you have three across two going back now this is 60 millimeters and that's 50 millimeters and this is just i don't know it's kind of that's the one thing about the game that i would probably change is the stand convention is very odd most of your figures that are on one inch bases will not fit on here because uh 50 millimeters is about two and a half inches 60 millimeter is probably a little less than three so it's, it's just it's a weird convention but that's kind of what they use uh, this here would be a legal one stand of legal cavalry so you have two units and they're on a uh, 50 by 50 stand so just thought I'd give you a visualization of that uh, not sure why they came up with that, but there's other things in here about, you know, the stands and the standard bearers and stuff, but they're not really all that significant. There's a section on unit formations, and basically in a nutshell, your formations tell you what is legal, and when you're in combat, depending on your formation, you may get extra uh, attacking power based on being supported. Okay, so then the next area is called reconnaissance and deployment. Again, as I said, this game tries to cover a lot of things. And essentially, 
Each player gets two scouts on foot and one mounted scout per two feet of battlefield length. So if you're playing on a 6x4, each player has six scouts. And essentially, you can send out your scouts to try to claim parts of the battlefield. Um, so other than that, I don't really think the scouts are an actual unit because they're not. There's no stand or basing for them in the book. There's a, a there's a rule for clash of patrols, meaning if if both of you have scouts in the same area, I guess you would throw d sixes. There's subterfuge. Uh, these are subterfuge cards. So this is kind of a whole pre-game phase where you're doing reconnaissance and you're attempting to claim the battlefield. The next area is, uh, it talks about your battle leader cards, your deployment. So this is kind of all bringing you up into the start of the game. Now, so we finally get to fighting the battle and basically the way the, the, the game is done is you are going to either use playing cards or they provide you with some cards you can copy in the back for your units. And your units are all commanded by a battle leader. So really it's the battle leader's card. This is the battle leader. His card would be pulled and then any units that he commands, he can activate them after he activates himself. Now, there is a rule if your battle leader is killed, you become what's called an uncommanded unit. And I, I believe you have a separate way of being activated. You don't activate in the phase with the battle leader. But going back here, once you have all your cards together, it says you should shuffle them, which I don't understand the reason of shuffling them because the next thing it says you can do is you pick up your shuffle deck and you arrange your cards in the order you want to activate them in. So, I don't know why you have to shuffle them if you're just going to rearrange them. But then once you pull the card, you can activate the battle leaders. And the battle leaders can do certain things. Once all the battle leaders are activated, then we get to what we are called activating uncommanded units in this phase. And, uh... I think they're activated in order of initiative. I think whichever player has the initiative can decide whether he wants to activate an uncommanded unit or force you to activate one of your uncommanded units. Yeah, so it says in an order of in an order determined by the player with initiative. So, uh, and then, you know, you calculate your victory or defeat. This section here actually discusses battle leaders and the commands that they can issue. Discussing battle leaders a little more, we get the command rating for battle leaders, moving your battle leaders. You can't shoot at battle leaders who are basically on their own. If a battle leader is attached to a unit and it takes damage, then the battle leader could possibly be injured. And that's where you see injuring your battle leaders. Uh, the odd thing is, even if a battle leader attaches to a unit, it still moves in the uncommanded phase. So unless it's his own unit, it, it's still considered uncommanded. Uh, and I think even if he attaches to one of his own units, it still is considered uncommanded because it moves when he only moves when it is activated. Which if, if the, the battle leader is uncommanded then uh, I mean the battle leader is not has, doesn't have a card the only time he could activate is in the uncommanded phase now this is an interesting section it's called duels so one of the things you can do as a battle leader is when your turn comes up you can challenge your opponent to a duel if he refuses the duel it's going to uh, have an effect on his courage of his unit and uh, it says like all friendly units within eight inches of him must immediately test for disarray which is a status change that they get because basically you see that your leader is a coward. So let's see how a duel would be fought okay. out. Okay, so here we have Godfrey, who is a mounted leader, and we have, uh, let's just call him Bedford, who's unmounted. Now this is their dual stats. So you get the three different types of dice, so just three dice in your dual stat for each leader. So Bedford has a D10, a D8, and a D6. Godfrey has two D10s and a D6. 
Now, actually, Godfrey actually has a stat of a D10, D8, and D6, like Bedford. The problem is if he's mounted, he gets the next die up. So he gets to go to two D10s and a D6. Having done that, you take your dice, and each person decides one dice that they're going to show the other person. So, for example, Bedford brings out his D6. Godfrey brings out his D10. And you roll, and the highest person is considered to have taken a wound. If both of them uh, match, I don't know if it's a tie, whether they both take a wound or neither take a wound, but I'll check that for ties. But for now, they both would take a wound. Now, the interesting thing about this strategy is, if I know my opponent has two D10s, and I have you know, only one, I can decide to save my D10 for the end. And say I do a D6, he does his D10, I know one of his D10s is gone. Right, and then say I do my D8 and he does his D10 again, I know his other D10 is gone, and for that last roll, I know I'm gonna have the advantage. Now the problem is <laughs> I could have already taken two wounds by that time, and I could all I could may have already lost the duel because it would be two wounds to one. But let's just say we want to fight this duel out between Godfrey and Bedford here. So it says the results of the duel are determined by comparing the number of hits each battle leader scores. It says if both battle leaders score the same number of hits, then the duel is fought to the deadlock. So if, if it's not really during the duel, but it's afterward that you determine. All right, so I'm just going to kind of do these at random. So it's a D10 versus D10, three and a seven. So he's taken one wound already because Godfrey won that one. Those dice are gone. This one. He rolled his D6. It was a 4 and a 2. So now he's taken one wound. But both of these dice are gone. And they're both left with a D10. So it's going to come down to this die. Oh, and they scored a tie. Both of them rolled 9s. So the battle would end with both guys having done one wound to each other. They fought to a deadlock. Every man's honor is intact. They will return to their lines. And this battle will be decided by the units on the, the next field. relevant section is how your battle leader commands your troops. And essentially, each unit can be giving, given up to four action points of commands. And each command has a certain number of action points attached to it. So say you have an archer unit and you want to order the archer unit to advance and shoot. The advance would be two action points the shoot would be two. So that would be four. So you could actually order it to do that. Or you could order it to shoot twice. And that would be two action points. Shoot and shoot. Uh, you could order a unit to do a supporting volley. But that would be four action points. That would be all it could do. To restore your ranks is four action points. To change formation. So you could do a change of formation. And then you could do an advance. You couldn't do a change in a charge. And you couldn't do a change in attack, but you could do a change of formation and a shoot. And so if you have uh, archers, and essentially that's kind of the most relevant part of your commands is the action point. Uh, One other thing I'll point out in the command section is the only way you can really initiate a combat with another unit is to charge it. And you do get a bonus in your attack for charging the unit. Uh, an attack action you have to already be engaged and with an advance order which is on the other page you can't move in the contact so it says you, you have to be within one inch at least one inch from your uh, enemy when you do an advance can be given advance or push forward command at this turn cannot move closer than one inch so you can't the only way to engage another unit in these rules is with a charge there's no kind of moving into them you have to actually do a charge okay I skipped over the rules on aligning the units and you know kind of measuring your distances you can look at that if you buy the rules the next section we're going to look at is shooting now the way shooting is worked out every infantry unit has a base shooting score of two per stand 
And by infantry, they basically mean archers or units that have something they can shoot. You know, if you don't have swords, I mean, if you have swords, you don't, you can't shoot anything because you have to have a weapon that's capable of shooting. If you are a cavalry unit with a weapon capable of shooting, you only get one die per stand, but a cavalry unit can shoot over other units. So to kind of illustrate this, if we take these archers, and this would be one legal stand of infantry archers, okay? So you have your three across and your three behind. This, this stand of archers, it says every stand would get two shooting, a shooting score of two dice for every stand. Now, if this was mounted archers, right, you would only get one. The difference is, though, if they were mounted archers, you could have two of these behind each other, and then they both could shoot. Whereas if it's infantry stands, only, only the you cannot shoot over one in front of you. So the ones in the back would not be allowed to shoot if there was a an allied or friendly unit in front of them. And basically, once you determine your shooting, you have a choice. You can you can do a single shot, meaning if you're ordered to do a single shot, in which case you stay where you're at, you remain still. Well, let me correct that. If you remain still, you can fire two volleys, or basically that infantry unit could roll four dice. If you move up and shoot, so remember earlier I said you could actually move two and shoot you would only get to fire one volley, which would just be two dice as opposed to four. Now, the way kills are resolved after you take into account cover or anything like that, which we're not going to really discuss right now, is simple because it's the same for melee attacks and missile attacks. Is You have what is called a killing strike, which is if you roll a six in any of your results, you have a strike, which is basically a, a pip that the unit takes if you roll a four or five and then a miss. So, for example, if we roll this, we have a unit that says it has one shot. Whoa! So this unit has done two killing strikes. Every killing strike actually removes a figure. Okay. On the other hand, if we roll again... He has a four and a three. The three is a miss. But the four would actually be a strike against that unit. So the unit would basically get a pip saying one strike has been scored on it. And then in the morale and melee phase, that would affect its ability to determine its status, whether it's going to be disordered or whether it's going to be disarrayed. Now, there is an exception when it comes to the killing strike row. If you are within what is called the killing range of your missile weapon, which is half or less of its maximum. So, for example, a uh, crossbow has a range of 30 inches maximum. 15 would be half. So, half of its maximum distance is 15. So, anything within that 15-inch range is in the killing distance. In the killing range four, fives, or sixes become kills. So let's say you have a unit that stays still. It rolls two volleys. It's within its killing range. So these both would be kills now. Whereas normally they wouldn't. They would just be strikes. So just because it was in that killing range, those fours now become kills as opposed to just strikes. Okay, so let's just take a look at a profile of a unit. This is what's called a Russian city militia. It, it can move four inches, has a discipline of one, a courage of one. What we want to look at is the resilience of four. Okay. So remember earlier when I told you about taking those strikes or pips. If you take a number of strikes or pips equal to your resilience or greater than your resilience, you have to roll to see whether or not you are disarrayed. And disarray can have an effect on the status of your unit. So, and then to do the disarray test is, you know, you essentially are going to be rolling a die. Uh, which I don't, 
I don't see exactly whether that's a D6 or not. I'm assuming it would be you'd have to roll less than or higher to your disarray. But I just wanted to point that out now to kind of show you what I was talking about the effect of strikes. So that strikes still have an effect even if they don't kill. You can disarray. Okay, I want to continue looking at the Russian city militia spearmen for an example of melee. Now, melee has a resolution that's somewhat similar to what we saw with uh, to what we saw with uh, shooting. So to do melee, basically the attacker chooses a target. You calculate the attacking unit's melee score, make the attack roll. Now, the odd thing is in this game, none of the units actually have an attack number. Which I thought, at first I thought it was a mistake. But if you notice on their stat profile, they have discipline, courage, resilience, defense. These have shields. But they don't have any attack number. There's no fighting number. There's no attack number. There's no anything. You don't really know that until the battle is engaged. What their actual attack is going to be. So for each unit, they will have their very own specific attack number based on their melee score. Now, this unit has something called melee infantry, which we're going to see in melee that that will add to your score. So basically, when you get into melee, the attacker or unit of melee gets one to its base melee score per stand in contact with the enemy. It says a unit has a base melee score of two per stand. If it has martial prowess, it adds another one to its base melee score. If the attacker... If it's charging, it adds one to its base melee score. And I think it adds one for every supporting stand that it has. And per supporting stand. So Let's just let's just give you kind of example of how you would calculate this. So score. in this example, we have this melee stand that has charged into this infantry stand. Now, they get two dice for being a melee stand. So every every melee stand gets two dice for being a melee stand. They get one dice per stand for having made a charge. They also get one dice because they are being supported. They have a supporting stand with them. Now, if we go back to our example of our example unit, if we assume that this is the, the Russian Baltic militia, because they are called melee infantry, as opposed to, let's just say, if the archers were attacking somebody in melee, they, they would not be melee infantry. But since these are designated specifically as melee infantry, then they would also get to add one to its score, base melee score per stand again. So that would come out to be another two dice. So as you can see, this kind of adds up very quickly for what their melee score would be. So we gave them their charge. We gave them their regular attack which is two per stand and there's only one stand attacking so they're not getting four because this is a supporting stand but they get one for every uh stand that's in support right so one per supporting stand which they only have one there but then because they're a melee stand they get another two per stand which is for this whole group so this is what they would roll against the cavalry and remember, we're using the same table to determine whether these are strikes or killing strikes. Okay. So having done all of that, initially, the only killing strike would be this 1-6. So that means they would actually remove one figure from here. Uh, I think the 4 would be a strike. The rest of those are all misses. Which, I mean, actually, that's probably a below average row so if we look at the book the six is a killing strike in melee four five or six is a strike and a one through three is a miss 
And so this 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 unit right here right here would actually have taken two strikes or two pips when it does its resilience test, but it would only have lost one figure uh, out of its stand. Now the unit could actually be more than this one stand. I mean, this could be your unit here, which is two stands, but it would have lost one figure from the killing strike. Now let's just assume they had a better than that row. Okay, so we'll re-row this. And this one, they've got two killing strikes. That was a four and three strikes so that's a total of five which just about is going to require anybody to take a resilience test now there's one thing we haven't looked at yet before casualties are actually determined you have to look at the defense rating of a unit for armor and cover and essentially for the defense rating of a unit the player controlling the target rolls a number of dice equal to the number of killing strikes his unit has suffered from the attack. For every die that scores equal to or less than the target's defense rating, one less casualty is inflicted. So in this attack, I think we said that there was, there was a result of two killing strikes. And so remember, these are only... You're only going to be resolving against the killing strikes. The strikes are not going to be, be come off because of your defense. But let's just, let's just get a sample profile for the So if we the assume knights. these are Teutonic Knights, the Teutonic Knights have a defense rating of 4. So if there was two killing strikes scored against them, they would roll two dice. And on a 4 or less, on those two dice, they would remove a strike. So let's just work this out. So they removed, they rolled a three and a one. So basically they would have taken no killing strikes. Now their resilience on the other hand is six. And we saw that they received five, but because that did not equal or exceed their resilience, they do not have to test for being disarrayed. One other last thing I will show you in the melee is we talked earlier about attaching leaders. Well, one of the results of attaching a leader is what's called a battle champion. So if you attach a leader, the leader can act as a battle champion for that unit. And he adds a number of dice equal to his courage score to the unit. So let's take a look at a sample. So in this leader. profile here, we have an army commander named the Grandmaster Sonier, who's a Templar, Templar Grandmaster. Right, and they gave him, his card is the Ace of Diamonds. So that way, if you're not using the cards in the back, you write down which card in the deck represents him. He has a Courage of three. So that meant if you actually attach him to one of his units, they get three additional melee dice. And that could have made the difference in this, this, this thing because they didn't have to test with those five. But if we wrote these three, and we got that extra hit, they're at a six. So now they're testing, the knights are testing to see if they're disarrayed because of the results of that leader being in the combat. So having looked at all of that, I mean, the rest of the rules are kind of straightforward. They've kind of progressed in a linear fashion. This is a section on melee results where basically after you're going to see if you were pushed back, uh, if you contact other enemies. Then we have a section as far as, uh, you know, when you're destroyed, if you move into a friendly unit, a section looking at casualties, how you determine which casualties are removed. And this deals with skirmishers, which is kind of a base uh, specialty unit. So it looks at how their attacks are to be resolved. Uh, this looks at your rear guard, how you deploy your rear guard, when they can come on. There's also a thing on deploying your outflanking force, which again, remember, is part of your rear guard. This is a section on terrain and buildings, how these will have an effect in the game as far as whether units are in buildings, what kind of uh, bonuses they get from cover, shooting at units from inside a building, terrain pieces, hills and rivers and line of sight, cliffs, ditches, marshes traits and reactions now the traits and reactions are actually assigned to units 
So these are units that these are things that can be given to a unit that will basically kind of distinguish it. So let's just take a look at one called fanatical assault. It says for every six six the unit scores when making an melee attack, it can roll another attack die. If this die also scores a six, roll to keep until you fail. So basically, you get to continue with the killing strikes. The more killing strikes you get. We have this rule called Black in the Sky, which is a 4 AP rule, which says uh, mass units of archers can rain down arrows. Uh, the unit picks a target following the normal rules. Blah, blah, blah. The effect. The unit performs a shooting attack with three volleys. So normally the most you can get two for not moving. With this, you would get two. The target counts as being in its front. Never counts as being in cover. And it causes one casualty against the target for every two killing strikes. So I don't know. Then they kind of water it down. So I don't really know if I like that. But that's a trait so all of these are different things that uh that your units can have one of the ones i think i see a lot is is martial prowess uh which a lot of your knights in them have right here where it says martial prowess the unit's melee score increases against certain opponents in addition it react it must first test this so these are kind of guys that are your, your stalwart fighters Lance Charge is another powerful one. All strikes, it scores count as killing strikes, even if the target. So that means you kill, you get killing strikes on four, fives, or sixes. So, for example, these Teutonic Knights, if they were to attack, since they have Lance Charge, and they were to just say, we let's do this real quick, they were to attack this stand of infantry, and let's just give them, you know, two, four. And then they roll. They probably would have more, but I'm not going to work that out exactly. So, in that track, this is actually one, two. That would be three killing strikes instead of two. Because four, fives, and sixes become killing strikes when you have, uh, when, when you have uh, Lance Charge. And that's essentially my review of the game. Uh, the last half of the section is actually taken up with your different scenarios uh, that you can play seize the baggage train glory and honor so they have a number of different scenarios uh, there's a section that gives you a lot of uh, well it gives you some army list so you can kind of pick a unit and decide whether or not uh, where it would fit in your army list it gives you some army composition so here you have your army commander who would be your battle leader his main force, some allied divisions, skirmish divisions, and so forth. This is actually probably more than one army working together. But it gives you some suggested armies and contingents. And then it gives you, there's also a little history section, which is actually one of the things I enjoyed about the book, was kind of reading about some of the, uh, some of the history of the uh, First Crusades and of some of the later Crusades. Uh, I actually found it very informative. You know, it talks about the siege of Antioch, the conquest of Jerusalem, and it kind of gives you a map of the Holy Land and the Levant. So overall, I would definitely recommend uh, Deus Vault to a serious war gamer. Can't really say that it's suited for fo solo play, like something like Kings of War is. But somebody like me, oh, I would definitely solo play this. I mean, if you like to take your time and get involved in a set of rules and nuance it and, you know, create real unique and distinct units with different battle abilities and traits, then uh, I would highly recommend Deus Vault to you. Take care, everybody.